Good evening. Hi, how is everyone out there? Uh, my name is Matthew Grunkemeyer. Uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I have a special interest in disorders of the hip. Uh, I do hip arthroscopy and hip replacement uh, and treat a variety of different um, disorders that are going to cause pain and going to cause people to need to come to the hospital or to the clinic to see me. So um, I'd like to get started tonight just by a basic slide looking at some of the anatomy of the hip joint. As you can see here, it's a basic ball and socket uh, type of joint. It's made up of uh, different types of cartilage. Uh, I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that there's primarily two types of cartilage that we deal with in the hip. Number one is the smooth cartilage, which is the uh, covers there you see that looks pretty purple on the ball uh, joint. That's called the articular or joint cartilage. Uh, that's supposed to be very smooth um, and it enables that uh, motion, that rounding motion that the hip makes in the socket. And then lining the socket is what's called the acetabular labrum. Uh, labrum, that's Latin for lip. That is a cartilage that surrounds uh, the whole of the socket and keeps it uh, intact. There are uh, issues with the hip where you can have some impingement or pinching. Uh, this can happen on the, uh, on the side of the hip called the cam, which you'll see in that slide, or on the top on the socket called a pincer. And most commonly, you're going to get a combined uh, type of impingement. This is what I would call pre-arthritis, and we'll see a lot of patients uh, will have a condition known as femoral acetabular impingement. That's where the, the ball uh, impinges up against the socket. That can cause some spurs to grow, and if that process occurs over many, many years, it can result in what we now know as hip arthritis. Oftentimes, athletes will get this. Sports that require cutting, jumping, high flexion of the hip. I see it sometimes in dancers. I see it in basketball players, etc. So the complaints that you're going to see with someone that has this is going to be generally a younger person who says, boy, it really hurts in my groin. It feels like it's stabbing me. It's pulling. It clicks. It locks. Sometimes they'll say that their hip feels like it's unstable. Um, and they'll kind of grab their thigh and say, wow, it hurts right here. And they'll make a, a C shape with their hand and they'll put that over their hip and say, that's where it really hurts me. Um, a lot of times they'll say it's painful when they just sit for a while and then they get up from sitting. Um, there's some special clinical signs that I'll go through when I see in the office to test and see if I think this might be something that's going on. And remember, this is in a younger patient typically, so they don't have, they have not developed arthritis yet. They've just maybe developed this tear in the hip. I'll get an MRI test, uh, and that is my test that I like to look at. Of course, I'll typically get an x-ray as well in the office first to look for arthritis or a fracture, uh, a bone tumor, some type of deformity. But if those tests are all normal, the next test, which is more sensitive, is an MRI. That's where you get a big magnet, and you go there and you lay down. It's usually about 20 minutes, so here's some loud clanging noises from the magnets whirling around your body. And then they'll so, show you a picture of the soft tissue, the muscles, the cartilage, uh, the joint fluid, uh, all these things that you may not see very well in just a plain x-ray. So it's my imaging test where I like uh, to order if I'm suspicious of a labrum tear. If you do have a torn labrum and you fail conservative care like anti-inflammatories and physical therapy, which Kathy's gonna talk about a little bit later, sometimes it necessitates surgery. This is actually me in the surgery uh, room um, and you can kind of see the setup. It's pretty complex, obviously. We've got a special table that's involved that kind of helps distract the leg to pull the thigh bone away from the pelvis uh, so we can get in there and safely get into the hip joint and enter in and see. I've also got an x-ray machine that's draped over top of the patient to confirm that I'm in the right spot with my surgical instruments. Uh, this is just an example of a little needle that gets into the joint uh, and opens it up, or the medical term is insufflates the joint, so opening it up so I've got enough um, space to do the work. So that's a hip arthroscopy, and that's a really effective treatment to treat what I call joint preservation. So this is for patients that are pre-arthritis, but they've got a tear in the cartilage, and there's some type of intervention I can do, such as repairing the labrum, cleaning out maybe some loose body or loose cartilage, uh, something to preserve the hip, to enable you to keep your own hip and still be able to return back to have motion and not have pain and be able to get back to sports and walking without so much discomfort. So that's a really nice um, surgery that we offer for 
typically our younger cohort patients who are gonna have uh, a problem around the hip joint. Another condition that I see quite a lot of, and it can affect uh, even younger patients, but typically it's in a slightly older cohort, is hip osteoarthritis. Now, the signs of this, you're gonna have a limping gait, maybe be unsteady on your feet. Uh, patients will complain, it's hard, I can't even put on my socks or shoes or wash my feet. Uh, when I'm sitting, in a chair, it's hard to get out of a low chair. Um, and uh, sometimes I'll feel like there's crunching or cracking in the groin, uh, and that's where the pain typically is. Uh, some patients will have pain that refers onto the buttocks or the side of the hip. Um, and they'll oftentimes present walking in with a cane or even a crutch or a walker, limping, uh, very painful condition. The hip interferes with uh, so many of your regular activities of daily living. Uh, that you need when you develop hip arthritis, it's very disabling. Now in the old days, there really was not a treatment for this. You went to the, see a doctor and they'd give you some arthritis medicine and say good luck and the next visit they'd give you a cane and maybe the next visit, you know, some crutches and, 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 then, and then eventually a walker and then, and then finally a wheelchair and uh, then you were just disabled and you were kind of stuck at home and eventually the hip joint would just lock up. So, in the 1960s, not that long ago, Sir John Charnley of Exeter, England, said, I am just tired of seeing these patients with hip arthritis. They're so miserable and there's very little I can do. And this condition tends to progress to the point where they're entirely disabled. And so, he came up with the very first, he called it the Charnley Low Friction Hip Arthroplasty. And so, he was the father of hip replacements. And uh, now I'm so grateful that uh, through the years we've been able to offer this to a variety of patients of different ages, um, different sizes, uh, and uh, different um, uh, stages of uh, severe arthritis to the point where we're able to pretty much give people back uh, a very nice uh, lifestyle after a successful hip joint replacement. So let's dig into that a little bit uh, more closely with some slides today. Essentially, uh, reasons for hip arthritis, uh, a replacement would be if the damage from any type of arthritis, and not just osteoarthritis, you can also get this from rheumatoid arthritis, from what's called avascular necrosis, which is another common cause, and from a variety of congenital hip uh, deformities like dysplasia, leg calf perthes disease, uh, and other uh, congenital conditions. Uh, can cause you to need a hip replacement. Also from trauma. If you fall down and severely break or injure your hip, if you have a stress fracture that doesn't heal, um, some of these uh, reasons, or even for a bony tumor uh, or new growth, these are all reasons why we routinely have to do uh, hip replacement uh, surgery. What do you see on the x-ray? Well, for a typical patient with uh, osteoarthritis, you're gonna start seeing bone on bone changes. On the right, you'll see the cysts that have formed over the femoral head, the leg is shorter visibly on that side. It doesn't look like a round ball. Like if you'll notice on the left side, it looks round, you can see the socket. On the right, the ball is now flattened. It almost looks like a football instead of a baseball. And uh, you can notice that the joint is starting to slip out of place. Those are the type of x-ray findings you'll see in an advanced patient with hip arthritis. The solution to this is a hip replacement surgery. Um, we're going to go in there and you can see the components I've outlined on this slide, uh, and basically replace that damaged socket. We're taking out the labrum, all those things that you saw on that first slide, all that anatomy is gonna be removed. Uh, that articular cartilage is gonna be replaced with a metal implant. That implant does not have nerve endings, and so it, uh, it enables you to keep the motion uh, without all that pain that you're suffering with the grinding of uh, the loss of cartilage. So there's a number of parts. Uh, obviously, as you can see, there's a stem that gets seated into the hollow of the femur or thigh bone. Uh, and on top of that, there's a little neck component and then a separate ball component. Then on the, on the uh, socket side or the acetabulum, you'll have a, a shell or liner, uh, a shell that's placed that goes up, butts up against the, um, the bone and the body will grow into that bone, and then a shell that's inserted into there. Um, now these components are made of different materials, but most state-of-the-art now is you're going to have a, for the, um, the acetabulum shell will be a type of metal 
uh, polymer, usually titanium, uh, which has a, a gritty surface where the bone grows into. Uh, then the, the shell that goes inside of that is typically what's called highly cross-link polyethylene. Medical translation, really hard plastic, okay? Uh, and then the ball, uh, moving on down, is typically made out of ceramic uh, or metal. And then it is attached to the stem. The stem is what goes into the femur. And that is also, once again, some type of hybrid titanium metal that is has a scratchy surface so that the bone grows into it. We typically don't cement the stems or the cups unless there is severe osteoporosis and we think that uh, the body could not handle the metal components and wouldn't have enough bone stock to grow into them. The uh, hip replacement surgery, uh, you can see here just some, uh, uh, some medical slides kind of detailing uh, more or less what we do. We go down, we uh, mechanically remove all those spurs and uh, the labrum and we replace that socket. You can see kind of in pictures there. And then we go into the hollow of the, of the thigh bone and we, uh, we ream or remove the inner part of the bone and in the hollow of the thigh bone, place that stem and ball and then snap everything in place. You keep your own muscles and tendons and everything around. And uh, we've tried to find ways to do that to spare those so that you can get a quicker rehab. So. There was classic approach or conventional surgery was to go in through the buttocks. Uh, that was typically uh, a little bit more extensive. So if you've heard people now say, oh yeah, I had my hip replaced and it was a breeze, it wasn't always that way. In the conventional approach, we um, would make a, a relatively large incision uh, and uh, have to cut some muscles off from around the thigh bone. And uh, it could take a little bit longer time for recovery. With the newer uh, anterior approach that many of us do, the uh, hospital stay is minimal, sometimes even just overnight or none at all. Uh, we use a smaller incision on the order of uh, three or four inches, uh, less muscle uh, trauma without detachments, just moving those muscles around and a little faster recovery. Uh, you can see typically uh, reduced uh, blood loss and, and, and diminished pain uh, and a little quicker uh, return to normal function. This just kind of shows a little bit there how we're kind of moving everything aside versus cutting any uh, muscles and having to re-sew them. So uh, the way we're able to do this, a couple of things. Uh, number one, you saw in the earlier slide of the uh, hip um, arthroscopy using an x-ray. When a patient is lying flat down on the table like you were for an anterior approach, you can use an x-ray. So what's nice about that is I can see the components as I'm seating them. I can tell exactly where the limb lengths are that I've got you just the same as the opposite side. A special table enables me to do this. You can see the patient lying there on that table. So she's lying on her back. And then this table, what it does is it hooks in and allows us to extend the hip. So we're actually uh, putting the, the foot, uh, you can imagine, door, down towards the ground and then turning the ankle outwards. And that enables me to pop the hip joint up through the front so I can access it and uh, get a successful uh, anterior hip uh, replacement. So technology has helped. Uh, this is another view of that table, uh, which has really revolutionized things. I first started doing this along with a surgeon, Dr. John Beaver, here in Northern Kentucky. Um, pretty early, about uh, 2008, uh, and then Dr. Hummel and Dr. Spanier have also come and joined the team and a and, and, uh, number of other uh, surgeons. And uh, we found the very good uh, results using this uh, table and using these anterior hip approach. So I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of those uh, benefits of the, uh, of the anterior hip replacement. Um, there's a couple different incisions. Both of them are good. I've kind of gone over to this bikini incision. You can see on the right, it's a little more transverse and it's got a few benefits, but the standard incisions on the left, both very good. I'm seeing in some of my patients a few uh, less wound complications with the side or twisted bikini incision. This is just an example of that incision. Uh, and uh, you can see it mapped out uh, there on the thigh. Uh, it kind of is in line with your skin lines. Um, there. Risks of hip replacement surgery. Of course, anytime you have a surgery that's good, which hip replacement is good, uh, it helps a lot of patients. You always need to talk about risks as well. I think that's only fair because nothing is without risk. Um, the biggest things we worry about are things like a dislocation event where the two components that I show you that move together 
maybe after a fall, uh, after some car wreck or trauma, uh, they, could, they could disassociate or dislocate. Hopefully, and most of the time, we can just get that back in place, but sometimes if uh, something is off, we may have to have a redo surgery to get that fixed. Leg length discrepancy, where one leg is shorter or longer than the other. Of course, uh, now with the x-ray guidance uh, hip replacement, that problem has really been diminished, uh, but that's something you worry about. Uh, infection, oh boy, surgical infections are nasty. Uh, if it gets down deep into the prosthesis, it could require multiple surgeries and prolonged IV antibiotics. Um, so not like strep throat, take a couple pills of antibiotics and you'll be fine in a couple days. So that's a big uh, risk that we like to avoid, and we do that with a uh, perfect sterile technique, uh, preoperative antibiotics, um, and, uh, uh, and thankfully it's a very rare uh, complication. Blood clots, likewise. Uh, if you get a blood clot that goes into your leg, uh, that can be locally very uncomfortable and can require prolonged uh, treatment with uh, blood thinning agents. If it, stay, it doesn't stay in your leg and dislodges and goes into your lung, it could cause severe problems. Um, so that's another thing we try to avoid with quick uh, rehab, getting up walking, and also usually some type of blood thinner agent such as aspirin or Lovenox uh, or Xarelto. A fracture. If you were to fall and fracture around the, the stem, uh, fracture around the components, you know that could require a redo surgery. Uh, once in a great while, the components will not grow in like they're supposed to properly into the bone, will not grab the, the components uh, of the replacement, the prosthesis, and they'll get loose, and then you'll have to have a redo surgery or um, any other thing like that would require, that might require a future surgery uh, to revise the components. Sometimes the plastic part uh, with time, especially the older ones, could wear out. They used to tell patients, oh, you'll get about five, to, or I mean, you'll, you'll get about 10 to 15 years, and then we'll have to redo the plastic component. That is not as true anymore with the newer materials. The highly cross-linked polyethylene seems to be lasting much longer. Uh, the wear seems to be on the order of one micron uh, a year. So I usually tell patients you might, you know, expect to get much longer out of your hip replacement, maybe even 30 plus years. So... Well, that's nice to know, although those studies are still ongoing because those uh, highly cross-linked components have only been in use for about the past say, 18, 20 years. So, well, why would you do this? You know, I talked about all these risks. What would be the benefits? Well, gee, it's going to reduce your hip pain. It will restore your mobility that you've lost. It corrects the deformity if you've uh, lost some length in your, le in your leg. Uh, you can, you know, be kind of evened out. You know, many patients complain, gosh, I can hardly even sleep at night. This is so painful. It lets you get back to sleep and other activities surrounding sleep that many people enjoy. Um, improves your overall uh, quality of life. And so that's why people go through hip replacement surgery. And I think we've got a really nice track record at St. Elizabeth. We've done uh, just a tremendous uh, volume of hip replacements and uh, have very nice outcomes. Um, uh, so good that we've even taken on, you know, uh, and, and are in the process of publishing quality and uh, other studies uh, that demonstrate uh, just the, the, the really good um, surgical team that we've gotten uh, here at St. Elizabeth to, to produce these type of uh, outcomes for patients. So uh, I'm really excited to be a part of the, uh, the team at St. Elizabeth. Um, we've just, uh, like I said, been pretty groundbreaking in terms of uh, doing uh, uh, you know, anterior hip replacement, rapid rehab. During this COVID uh, epidemic, uh, many of us uh, saw that, you know, we were going to have a hard time getting patients uh, the care that they needed because we were concerned about um, uh, being able to treat patients surgically and still have enough supplies for the COVID patients. And so we had to transition a bit to uh, outpatient joint replacement. And uh, we were already Thankfully, it had that program set up, uh, but many of us uh, were doing maybe 20% of our patients as an outpatient, and uh, like I was, and probably the majority would spend the night or a night or two in the hospital. And we learned through COVID uh, that you're actually able to, to do many, many more people as an outpatient than you would think. And so because 
sometimes, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. And so uh, I've actually gotten to where probably 80, 90% of my patients are able to have their hip replacement surgery done and go home the same day. So that's really been a very, very exciting thing. I didn't put any slides up on it, but uh, people love to hear that because they love that they could considerably come in, um, you know, walk in or maybe limp in, uh, have their surgery and walk out uh, for dinner. And uh, that is a really nice thing. And it's, I'm grateful to be able to offer that to so many patients and see these uh, good results. So I'm gonna turn it over now uh, to um, uh, Kathy and she's gonna talk about some physical therapy aspects, uh, both uh, to uh, regaining of function and maybe after hip surgery or some things that can be done uh, to treat hip pain non-surgically uh, and uh, some exercises and other things. So. We'll go from there, and then uh, we'll probably have some questions that you guys uh, may want to ask, and we'll open up the uh, forum for questions. Good evening. My name is Kathy Bamer. I'm a physical therapist and certified athletic trainer at Santa Elizabeth Healthcare Sports Medicine. I'm also board certified in sports physical therapy, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about physical therapy and hip surgery. The first thing that you wanna do before having hip surgery is to get your home ready for surgery. You want to move things to waist level and place things that you're going to use frequently near the area where you're going to be staying, such as your cell phone, medication, TV remote, etc. You could also prepare meals in advance or have friends and neighbors prepare meals for you so that you don't have to do any kind of cooking or standing for any length of time after your surgery. I always recommend removing throw rugs. That's the first rule of home health is remove all the throw rugs or any kind of um, area rug that would cause a tripping hazard. And you wanna make sure that you clear a path for walking because you're going to be doing this activity quite a bit after your surgery. If your bathroom is an unsafe um, environment, you may want to have someone install grab bars that will help you get in and out of the shower or in and out of the bathtub much easier. And I do recommend wearing supportive shoes, not slippers. So what type of equipment might you need? Um, you may need a shower chair or an elevated toilet seat. I do recommend if you have um, standard toilets to consider a chair height toilet. It will definitely make your transition um, getting on and off the commode much easier. A lot of people will use a walker after surgery. If you do need a walker, the hospital will provide you one while you're on site. You may use crutches or a cane depending on what your surgeon requires after surgery. What else can you do to prepare for surgery? I like to recommend having a healthy diet. So um, making healthy choices such as quitting smoking, controlling your diabetes, losing weight. Um, if you can eat healthy before surgery and definitely the two or three days before surgery, thinking about drinking a minimum of six to eight glasses of water that will help um, so that you do not get dehydrated and it will also help let your body flush out the anesthetics. People will ask us a lot of times when they see us in physical therapy, what exercises can you do before surgery? Um, one of the most important is breathing exercises. This will increase the flow of oxygen to your lungs and that will help you prevent complications. It will also help you stay relaxed to manage your post-operative pain. So one of the breathing exercises that you can do is in, inhale deeply through your nose and then exhale slowly like you're going to blow out candles on a birthday cake. So breathing in slowly and out slowly and keeping your lips in that pursed position where you're like you're blowing out a candle. The next thing I recommend is getting to know the pain scale. There is a scale called the Universal Pain Assessment Tool. What this will do is it will... Um, prepare you to be able to identify what your pain is on a scale from zero to 10. You will have pain after surgery. I think that some people think that once they have the, the surgery, you're gonna feel better, but you will have pain from the incision site and from uh, where they go through the tissue to repair whatever surgery you're having. Your pain will be evaluated by your medical staff using the pain scale. So if you become pr familiar with this scale, you'll be able to, to give, give your pain a number to describe your pain. What we wanna know is, are you having any pain at all? Does it feel comfortable? Can you give it a one or two where you can have some mild pain and maybe be able to work through things? Three or four 
five to six are more like that moderate type pain, and then seven, eight, nine, and 10 are, are pain levels that we do not want you to push through. So you would wanna notify your medical staff if the pain got that high. So exercises that you can do preoperatively, um, very basics is an ankle pump where you move your feet back and forth. That helps prevent blood clots and get your body ready for surgery. Um, you can do glute or buttock squeezes. Um, you could do some thigh squeezes, which are quadricep sets. And then abduction heel slides is basically lying on your back and moving your um, leg out to the side. And then a heel slide moving your heel toward your buttock. So how long will you be in the hospital? Each uh, year, it seems like the stay in the hospital gets quicker and quicker. So if you're having a hip arthroscopy, you might have a procedure that's um, in same day surgery. And a lot of our total hip replacement procedures are being performed in an outpatient setting as well. Some people may have an inpatient stay and that would be one to two days post procedure, depending on your overall health. Um, the outpatient procedures, you're discharged the same day and your surgeon will discuss this option with you based on your health overall. And I do recommend if you're living alone to have someone plan to stay with you for about four to five days after surgery because you may need the help around the house. So to control your pain after surgery, if you had a total hip replacement, the arthritis pain will be gone, but you will have pain from the incision sites and the, where the muscles and soft tissue have been affected. Um, as you uh, start to heal and get stronger, your pain will decrease. We recommend icing for 15 to 20 minutes after performing your home exercise program and walking. Another question that people often ask us is when you can drive after surgery. Uh, we want to make sure that you are off all of your pain medication. So I usually tell people it will be about four to six weeks. If it's the left hip, it may be a little bit sooner, but definitely once you're off the pain medication. Another thing I like to tell people is if you have someone that can take you to practice like in an empty parking lot, you want to be able to safely control your vehicle before you even attempt to drive. Another question that we get uh, frequently is when can I take a shower? And that really depends on the surgical dressing such as skin glue or staples. Your medical staff in the hospital will educate you on when you can shower, but that's usually between one and five days post-operatively. So post-op physical therapy for a total hip replacement starts the day of surgery. So once you wake up and recover, you're going to start doing some ankle exercises, those ankle pumps that helps prevent blood clots. And then your physical therapist in the hospital will help teach you bed mobility, how to get in and out of bed, how to stand from the bed, how to sit in and out of a chair. And then you will begin walking with a walker or on crutches. And then they will practice uh, stair climbing with you, going up and down stairs, and practice getting dressed so that we can make sure that you're safe when you get home. So you will also begin walking three to five minutes every couple of hours. Once you get home, uh, you may find this easy to, like I said, if you created a path in your home to plan on, just set your uh, an alarm on your clock or on your cell phone to remind you every couple of hours to get up and walk, that will help get your blood circulating and help keep your hip from getting stiff. We want you also to do some ankle pumps. If those are easy, you could do some toe raises. And then we like for our patients to do glute sets where you squeeze your buttock muscles and squeeze your thigh muscles. Those are the quadricep sets. And then the hip slides out to the side. And then bending the knee up toward the butt is called your heel slide. And then while you're sitting and watching television or reading, you could always do some seated knee flexion and extension, which is basically bending and straightening your leg. And then after you finish that, putting some ice on the hip for about 15 to 20 minutes would be a great idea. If you're having a hip arthroscopy, such as a labral repair, the physical therapy is a little bit different because you may be coming to outpatient physical therapy. Some of the physicians will put you in a post-operative brace and our patient here is wearing one of the braces now. She's had a hip labral surgery. You come out of that surgery and you're usually weight bearing as tolerated in the brace. You know, we wanna be able to decrease your pain with the ice and any kind of, you know, relaxation techniques. You wanna increase your range of motion to tolerance. So you'll be allowed to move your hip into whatever position you can comfortably as long as there's no pinching. And again, we go to the gluteal sets, which are the butt squeezes, and the quad sets, which are your thigh squeezes. And then you're actually able to ride an upright bike right away after surgery, depending on what your symptoms are like. So the next phase would be the four to eight week phase. 
that's when you're allowed to really begin some strengthening. So you can start single leg activities, working on balance and strength. You can do squats and um, calf raises, things like that in a pain-free range of motion. And any kind of stretching that feels comfortable, you're allowed to do at this point. As far as cardiovascular exercises, you're able to do the elliptical trainer, you can swim, and then we'd like you to stay on that upright bike. So hip arthroscopy, the eight to 12 week is when you're really allowed to start becoming more active as far as uh, strengthening goes. You can do some lunges and lateral lunges, increase your weight on the squats, you can do leg press. And then this is when we get to begin the plyometric exercises if your activity level warrants this. If you're an athlete and you want to be able to jump and run and cut, you'll be allowed to start doing those kind of activities. And then you'll be able to do the walk jog program. And then finally, the 12 to 16 week fa uh, phase of the program, we do continued strengthening. So you should be doing everything in the gym that you did preoperatively or that you would have preferred to do preoperatively. And then we can add the, to those plyometric exercises and return to sport activities such as shooting basketball, kicking a soccer ball, um, golfing, whatever your activity of choice is. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kathy Bamer at St. Elizabeth Sports Medicine. Have a good evening.